Hello, all pastors, seminarians, and saints around the world who have hope in heaven. Greetings. It is nice to meet you. I am a center instructor who learned the word of revelation from the leader of the Philip tribe amongst the 12 tribes of Shincheonji, and my name is Chun Gun Ah. Our tribe leader has learned the words of the theology of revelation from the chairman of Shincheonji. Thank you very much for attending the Shincheonji online seminar, the testimony on the parables of the secrets of heaven and their true meanings today. Although our denominations and doctrines may be different, we are all believers who hope for God and heaven. Since God is the Word, I hope you meet God through the Word and hear about the parables so that this may be a precious time of understanding the secrets of the kingdom of heaven with much blessing. Last time, you heard about the figurative food and yeast. If you are a believer who hopes for heaven, you will have to meet the faithful and wise servant whom Jesus had promised in the New Testament. Use the word at the proper time as a true food and be transformed through God's yeast to become a believer who will enter the kingdom of heaven. What have you thought about the topics that appear in the book of Revelation and the four Gospels of the New Testament? Have you thought of them literally? Or have you thought that there may be another hidden meaning inside of it? Jesus had prophesied the secrets of the kingdom of heaven through parables and in figurative language. So through this time today, we would like to share with you the contents of the true meanings contained in the text. First, let me give you the answer to the parables about the bowl, scale, and rod. The figurative bowl refers to a person, a person's heart, or an organization. The scale is the word that weighs the faith and the actions. And the figurative rod or staff represents the word and a person who has the word. And finally, the figurative iron scepter symbolizes the ecclesiastical authority to rule. I believe that you pastors already know about these. But I would appreciate it if you could listen to what I'm explaining today once more. The figurative bowl, scale, and rod or staff that we will discuss today are used as physical tools in the books of history or instructions in the Bible. However, in the books of prophecy, they have spiritual meanings under the guise of the physical characteristics. So today, we will find out the spiritual meaning of each of these tools appearing in the books of prophecy. Now, let's first take a look at the figurative bowl. I will explain the basis of its true meaning through the words of the Bible in detail. Let's read Revelation chapter 15 verse 7 in regards to the parable. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. Yes, in this reference verse, It is written that the seven angels received the seven golden bowls and inside of them are filled with the word of God's wrath. And it says they pour out the wrath of God on the earth. Let me show you what it looks like. I am angry. Like this, this bowl was filled with wrath and poured onto the earth. Right. Don't I look ridiculous? If the bowls in the verse were literally physical bowls, they cannot contain the Word of God, can they? There are two types of bowls mentioned in the Bible. One is a physical bowl, and the other is a spiritual bowl expressed under the guise of the characteristics of a physical bowl. Then. What is the true meaning of the spiritual bowl which is disguised as a physical bowl in the books of prophecy? 
Let's find out. Now, in order to understand what the spiritual bowl means, first, let's look at the characteristics of a physical bowl. A physical bowl is an instrument for holding something. So, the name is decided depending on the contents that are inside. For example, if you put rice in it, it is called a rice bowl. If you put soup in it, it is called a soup bowl. And if it contains water, it is like a water cup. These various types of bowls appear in the Bible expressed as bowls, pottery, jars, quarts, cups, etc. And bowls have a characteristic that they must be made by someone. If you look at Isaiah chapter 64 verse 8, a potter who makes the pottery appears, and he makes pottery by pouring water into the clay, molding it and baking it with fire. Here, God is compared to the potter and the clay to the men. Then, what is this bowl that is made out of men that is likened to this clay? Let's read Romans chapter 9, verses 21 to 24 and find out. Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for noble purposes and some for common use? What if God, choosing to show His wrath and make His power known, bore with great patience the objects of His wrath prepared for destruction? What if He did this to make the riches of His glory known to the objects of His mercy, whom He prepared in advance for glory, even us, whom He also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles? Yes, you have read well. It says that we are the pottery whom He called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. Therefore, we can see that pottery is a person who has been especially chosen from among many people like the dust and called by God, who is the potter. And it means an appointed worker who takes the word of God, which is like food, in their heart and preaches it. And so in the words of Acts chapter 9, verse 15, we can see that Jesus compared Apostle Paul to a chosen vessel. Before being chosen, Paul was a man who zealously persecuted, killed, and caused much harm to the Church of Jesus and its saints. However, after he was chosen by Jesus, he took the lead in proclaiming the name of Jesus more than any other person. When we read Apostle Paul's confession in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, he said, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, is what he had said. What does the excellency of the knowledge here refer to? In Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 to 12, Apostle Paul said, The gospel I preached is not something that man made up, but I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Therefore, after hearing the revelation of Jesus Christ, Apostle Paul threw away all the filth inside of him, and he transformed into a new person. There is even a saying in the world that describes a person who is narrow-minded and self-centered. We say that the person's bowl of their heart is small, whereas for those who are generous, we say the bowl of their heart is big. Furthermore, there is a phrase which says that large bowls take longer to make. And so, in the same manner, the spiritual bowls in the Bible are talking about people. 
as the bowl of the heart that holds the word of God. So I hope that we too, like Paul, will be chosen as God's vessels and be changed by listening to the word of revelation and by putting it in our hearts so that we can be renewed. Next, we're going to look at the types of bowls. There are a countless number of kinds of physical bowls, but there are only two types of spiritual bowls. One is the bowl of God, and the other is the bowl of Satan. Wouldn't all believers want to become the bowls of God? But just because you want to become God's bowl doesn't mean you can be one. It is not the appearance of the bowl that is important, but the type of bowl is determined depending on what is contained inside of it. For example, even if it may be old and rugged, if the box contains jewels, it becomes a jewelry box. And even if a bowl is made of gold, if there is trash inside, it becomes a garbage can. In the same way, for spiritual bowls, If truth, which is like the food of God, is inside of the bowl, it becomes God's bowl. And if falsehood, which is like Satan's food, is contained, then the bowl becomes that of Satan. Then you, the listeners of these words, will also need to think to yourself about what kind of food you are holding and ask yourself what kind of bowl you are. No matter how hard one may try to lead a zealous life of faith, if there is no truth inside of the person, there is no way that the person can become a bowl of God, but the person will be that of Satan. However, without knowing what kind of bowl a person is, if anyone stays as is without emptying the falsehood from inside, what would be the result of that bowl? Let's read Jeremiah chapter 48, verses 11 and 12. Moab has been at rest from youth, like wine left on its dregs, not poured from one jar to another. She has not gone into exile. So she tastes as she did, and her aroma is unchanged. But days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send men who pour from jars, and they will pour her out, they will empty her jars, and smash her jugs. Yes, there are the people of Moab that appear in the verses. They were originally God's chosen people, but they became corrupted and worshipped Gentile gods, and so they became like the Gentiles. They were referred to a jar with dregs because their hearts were full of their own wrongful thoughts and dirty things when they should know and keep the word of God. So God said that He would send men who pour from jars, and so they will empty her jars and smash her jugs, is what it said. This is the word of prophecy that was fulfilled at the first coming of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 23, verses 25 to 26, Jesus said to the Sadducees and the Pharisees, The outside of the cup and dish are clean, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. So he called them as hypocrites, who are different inside than they are on the outside, comparing them to the jars full of dregs. Here, we see that Jesus himself was the one who poured the jars and smashed the jugs and passed judgment upon them. From this, we can tell that if one puts the word of truth in their heart and become God's bowl, the person will receive blessings. But Satan's bowl, filled with the falsehood and their own thoughts, will end up with judgment and curses. This shows that just because someone attends a church to keep their faith superficially does not lead them to heaven. But only those who fill their hearts with the word of God will be recognized as God's precious bowls that can reach heaven. Then, 
First, we have to empty the things of Satan that are filled inside of us and wash ourselves clean, right? We cannot welcome guests with dirty or not fully cleaned plates. Also, do we not prepare with special bowls and plates when we treat special guests? God as well does not see all the bowls as equal, but He sets aside bowls for noble purposes. People usually value luxurious and expensive bowls made of good materials, but it is said that God uses clean bowls for noble purposes. If you read 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21, it is said, If a man cleanses himself, he will be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy and useful to the Master. Now then, what should we do to cleanse our hearts? The Bible says there is the water that washes our hearts. If you first look at John chapter 15, verse 3, Jesus said to His disciples, You are made clean because of the word I have spoken to you. And if you read 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, it is said, You have purified yourselves by obeying the truth. Just as dirty things are washed away by physical water, what cleanses a dirty soul is the Word of God. It is the Word of God. Even now, this is the place where the words of Revelation, in which the words of the parables are clearly opened and they are coming out. So as you receive the words of testimony one by one, I hope that your heart and your bowl will be purified through these words. So far, we've been looking at the bowl that is compared to a person's heart. In the Bible, there are even larger bowls that can hold people. If you look at Matthew chapter 13, verses 47 through 50, it is said that the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish, and also that they collected the good fish in baskets but threw the bad ones away. The words of Matthew chapter 13 is a spiritual content that Jesus spoke regarding the secrets of the kingdom of heaven in parables. The fish mentioned here, according to Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 14, refers to men who are likened to this fish in the sea. And this shows that there are two types of people, those who are righteous, who are put into the basket in the end times and saved, and those who are wicked, who are thrown away and receive judgment. So then, what does a bowl that can hold people refer to? It refers to the place where God's saints are gathered, which is a church. To summarize, bowls have two spiritual meanings. We saw that the value changes depending on what kind of content it holds, right? If what is held is the word, that bowl refers to a person's heart. But if what's contained are people, then that bowl is an organization like a church. Do you see this clearly about the figurative bowls? Next, let's take a look at the figurative scale. Let's read the parable related to this in Revelation chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures, saying, A quart of wheat for a day's wages, and three quarts of barley for a day's wages and do not damage the oil and the wine. Yes, in these reference verses, when the third seal was opened, a black horse came out. It is said that the rider on this black horse was holding a pair of scales in his hand. There are two types of scales mentioned in the Bible. One is the physical scale, and the other is the spiritual scale that is likened using the physical scale. The word of Revelation is a prophecy of the time of the second coming of our Lord Jesus. 
so we will examine the meaning of the figurative scales in order to understand the actual entity of this prophecy written in parables. First, let's take a look at the physical characteristics of the scale. A scale is a tool used to measure the weight of an item when buying things at the market. So, it is a tool that determines whether the weight of an object is light or heavy by weighing it. So, we can say that a scale is a tool or a standard for judging, right? Then, what is weighed on the spiritual scale that appears in the books of prophecy, which is likened with the physical scale? Because when it comes to the spiritual things, there are two types, one that belongs to God and one that belongs to Satan. So there is also the scale of God and the scale of Satan, right? First, let's look at the scale of God. What does the scale of God weigh? And also, what does it even mean to weigh? In Proverbs chapter 24, verse 12, it says that God weighs the heart of a person with the scale of God. And also, it says, does not he who watches over your soul know it? So God weighs our hearts and He examines them. Also, what we have in our hearts get revealed through our deeds or actions. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 3, it is said that our deeds are weighed and that He will judge us according to our deeds. Therefore, the scale is a tool for judgment and it is to judge the hearts and the actions of the believers based on God's scales as to whether or not they are worthy in God's sight. If you look at the words of Job chapter 31 verse 6, it says that God's scales are honest scales. Since God's judgment is righteous, and He judges anyone who is on the scales with a fair standard. We must become worthy believers who are unified with God's heart. In the courts of the world, people are judged whether their actions are sinful or not according to the compendium of the laws. So these code of laws can be compared to a scale because it is a standard for judging the weight of the criminals who have been brought into the court. So you can see that the scale is represented in many of the logos of the administrative agencies related to law. This would mean that the law is like a scale and it contains the will to judge fairly according to the law. God also weighs our faith and actions based on the standard of His laws. Everyone, then what are the laws that believers should keep? It is the Word of God. The Word of God is the standard of our faith and it is the law. That is why God judges everything using the Word of God as the scale. What if God's scales show that our faith and our actions are lacking? Then, what would happen? In Daniel chapter 5, verses 25 through 30, there is the king of the Gentile nation of Babylon, King Belshazzar, who had committed a sin before God by drinking the foreign wine using God's goblets that they had taken from the temple of God, and he had worshipped Gentile gods. At that time, the fingers of a human appeared and began to write, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Parsin. And the meaning of the word Tekel here is that the king has been weighed on the scales of God and had been found wanting. 
The phrase found wanting means that his actions were not appropriate and they were lacking in God's eyes. As a result, the king was put to death that very night. The reason we looked at this story is that the work of judgment using the word happens in today's time as well, in the time of the New Testament. In John chapter 12, verse 48, it is said that the word that Jesus has spoken will judge people on the last day. And in Revelation chapter 20, verse 12, it is said that the books are opened and people are judged according to what they had done, according to the standard of the word recorded in the books. Here, the books that are opened are the words of God from the 66 books of the Bible. So, I hope that you come to an understanding of God's word through the word that has been opened clearly so that all of you may enter heaven through the faith and the actions that are after God's heart. For this scale, there is not only the scale of God that exists, but there is also the dishonest scale, that is, Satan's scale. Let's read Proverbs chapter 11, verse 1. The Lord abhors dishonest scales, but accurate weights are His delight. Yes, we see that God abhors dishonest scales, but He is pleased with the accurate weights, that is, the fair scales. Here, the fair scales refers to God's scales, and the dishonest scales are Satan's scales. The standard on a scale is the weight or the pendulum. God's scales are of accurate weight, that is, the truth whereas Satan's dishonest scales are of deceiving weights, which is falsehood. This is the word that is added to or taken away from the words of the Bible as seen in Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 to 19, the arbitrary interpretation and man's teaching, which are commentaries. Therefore, it is very important for us believers to distinguish between the truth and the falsehood. In Hosea chapter 12, verse 7, it is recorded that the merchant uses dishonest scales and that he loves to defraud. In this verse, the church is compared to as the market where the merchant with dishonest scales, the false pastor with the falsehood or the lies does the act of defrauding. This false pastor, deceiving the saints with falsehood, this is the same as defrauding. As the Old Testament prophecy says, the pastors who deceived the souls of countless people with dishonest scales at the first coming were the Pharisees and the scribes. The physical Israelites at that time could not receive Jesus who came to the earth with the truth as God's true pastor. This was a sad result of the souls being deceived because they failed to distinguish the scale of God and the scale of Satan. Therefore, we who are living in the end of times must discern between God's scale and Satan's scale. In Revelation chapter 18, verse 2, we can see that the dwelling place of demons, which is the organization of Satan, Babylon, appears at the time of the second coming. And in Revelation chapter 18, verse 15, it says that there are merchants who mourn because they cannot buy and sell Babylon's goods because Babylon has fallen. These very merchants are the false pastors with Satan's scales. So let's summarize the spiritual meaning of the scale. The scale refers to the word that weighs our faith and our actions. I pray 
that all the families of heaven who are listening to this word today will not be deceived by Satan's scales, but become the worthy believers in God's sight who are weighed on God's scales. Next, let's take a look at the figurative rod or staff. Let's read the related parable in Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, Go and measure the temple of God and the altar, and count the worshippers there. But exclude the outer court, do not measure it, because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. Yes, in Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, the angel gave Apostle Paul a reed like a measuring rod to measure the temple and the altar and to count the worshippers there. Now, there are two types of rods in the Bible, a physical rod and a spiritual rod, which is under the guise of the physical rod. In order to understand the reality of this spiritual rod that is hidden in parables in the words of prophecy, let's find out the meaning of the figurative rod or staff. First, let's look at the physical characteristics of the staff. The staff is mainly used and relied on by the elderly, people with disabilities, or people who go hiking. With these physical characteristics, a staff is a helping tool that the user relies on. And for those who are blind, this can also become an eye for them so that they can distinguish things. Also, this staff can have a symbolic meaning as the authority to rule. It will be easy to understand if you think of the baton stick that the com commander has in the military. Now then, what is the true meaning of the figurative staff or rod in the books of prophecy which were expressed using the characteristics of a physical staff or rod? I will explain in detail about the true meaning according to the Bible. If you read Psalms 23 verse 1, God is compared to as a shepherd. And just as a shepherd leads and feeds his sheep through the staff and the rod, it is said that God will comfort God's people who are like the sheep with his staff and his rod. Here, the sheep is compared to as God's people in Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 31. So just as a shepherd protects and guides his sheep with his staff, God protects and guides his people with his staff. Then, let's read Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 29, to understand what the staff of God is. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? Yes, in this verse, it is said that the word of God is like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces. So, this hammer is the word of God. So just as a shepherd comforts, protects, and guides his flock with his staff, God protects and guides his people with his word, which is his staff. So if you are a shepherd, you must lead God's people to heaven with the staff of this word, correct? Also, the saints who are the sheep must also be led to heaven by relying on the word of God. And in Isaiah chapter 11 verse 4, it is said that he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. Of course, it is not a real stick that comes out of a person's mouth, right? As what comes out of a mouth are the words. It means that the world will be judged with the words that come out of the mouth. 
In the past, as parents used to use sticks even on their beloved children so that those children do not go down a wrong path. God uses the rod of His Word to guide people on the right path, or He judges with the Word in order to set this world straight. Next is a second meaning of the rod or the staff. A person who has the word can also be a rod. In Isaiah chapter 36 verse 6, the king of Egypt is said to be a splintered reed of a staff to all who depend or lean on him. It is said that if anyone leans on this staff, it will pierce the person's hand and that it will wound the person. If you look at the historical circumstances, the Israelites who were held captive in Egypt were enslaved for 400 years and depended on Pharaoh the king. But in this verse, God compared the king Pharaoh as a splintered reed of a staff, as he is not the person that they were to depend on. Then, who was the one that the Israelites had to depend on? It was Moses, the messenger of God who had led the Israelites to the land of Canaan. The circumstances were the same at the time of the first coming. Just as the king of Egypt ruled over the people of Israel in the time of Moses, those who were governing God's people at the first coming were the Pharisees and the scribes. At that time, all of God's people depended on the Pharisees and the scribes in their life of faith. However, Jesus referred to these people as the serpents and the brood of vipers, revealing that they are the false pastors belonging to Satan. And he testified that if anyone uses them as their staff, that they would not be led to the kingdom of heaven. If so, who was the staff of God that God's people had to rely on at the time of the first coming? It was Jesus, the true shepherd, the true messenger and pastor whom God was together with, just as it was Moses in the old days. Today, we also need to think about what kind of rod or staff we have been holding on to and relying on so far, and we must look to find the rod or the staff of God. We should be able to discern whether the pastor who is with me is a rod or staff of God who leads me to heaven, or that of Satan who delivers the falsehood so that we no longer depend on the splintered reed of a staff, but go towards a true pastor who is like God's rod who has the word of truth. If we summarize now the figurative meaning of the rod or the staff, it refers to the person who has the word and the word as well. Now lastly, let's take a look at the meaning of the iron scepter and let's read Revelation chapter 2 verses 26 and 27. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father. Yes, from the verses in the scriptures, it is recorded that Jesus will give this iron scepter that he had received from his Father to the one who overcomes so that he may rule over the nations with it. What does the iron scepter mean here? In John chapter 17 verse 2, it is said that God had granted Jesus authority over all people. And in verse 8 of the same chapter, Jesus said, For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. This is what it said. So the meaning of the iron scepter that we had seen in Revelation chapter 2 is the ecclesiastical authority to rule all the nations. As Jesus had received the word from God, He had the ecclesiastical authority to rule the religious world at that time, right? As an iron scepter can break things in pieces like the rod, a pastor who has the word can preach and teach the word to all people 
Thus has the authority to govern and to judge them. This authority is likened to the iron scepter. Since Jesus had promised to give the authority of the iron scepter that he had received at the first coming to the one who overcomes at his second coming, in the end, in today's time when the prophecies are fulfilled, we must find the one who overcomes who has received the authority of the iron scepter and rules the nations with it. Therefore, the meaning of the iron scepter is the ecclesiastical authority to rule. Did you enjoy today's lesson? Now let's draw the conclusion for today. The figurative bowl symbolizes a person or an organization like a church where people are gathered together. The figurative scale is the word of God that weighs the faith and the actions. And the figurative rod or staff represents the word and a person who has the word. And lastly, the figurative iron scepter is the ecclesiastical authority to rule. Just as the name of a bowl is determined according to what kind of content is in it, we need to put the perfect Word of God inside of our hearts in order to become God's bowls, the people of God who can be used for noble purposes. And, we need to cleanse our hearts, our bowls with the word of revelation, which is clearly open today, so that we can be reborn as the perfect believers and be found to be without a speck or blemish when God, who looks at the heart, weighs us with God's scales. The secrets of heaven that have been hidden in parables to this day. Only when we understand the secrets, will we be able to go to heaven. The reason why Shinchenji can clearly testify to these parables according to Jesus' promises is because the reality of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven spoken in parables has been revealed. The next lesson will be about the figurative fire, censer, and pot. I hope that you will listen carefully to the next lesson as well, understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven and become the people of heaven who are acknowledged by God. Now, lastly, to show that we are one in God and in Jesus, let us shout, we are one together. I will say, we are one first. Then please raise your finger like this and we will shout it out together. We are one in God and in Jesus. We are one. Let us pray. The Creator, Lord, Father God, to whom we are thankful, we give you gratitude for guiding your beloved people of heaven as well as the pastors so that all can be gathered at the online seminar and that we can share your word at this time today. Father God, today we have listened about the figurative bowl, scale, and rod. Please govern the hearts of all who attended so that they can become God's bowls and also become worthy believers when weighed on your scales. Also, help everyone so that the word does not stop here by being listened to only once. But may this word of revelation continue to be spread to the saints who are nurtured by our beloved pastors through the upcoming lessons of the online seminar. Also, Lord, please help our beloved pastors so that as the seminar continues, that they become the kind of people of heaven who become even more thirsty and hungry for righteousness. We earnestly prayed all these things in faith in the name of our Savior Jesus Christ who has brought us from death into life. Amen. Thank you very much for listening all the way to the end.